I think one of the things, Shane, about being a podcaster, mm-hmm. a podcast star. Oh, yeah. We're definitely stars. Is that uh, your listeners hear you and they're like, what do they look like? Oh, yeah. The people want to know sure. like, what, what, what you really look like. And uh, I'm here to tell you, you probably don't. No, not, not us. Not us. <laughs> uh, it's really going to let you down. Yeah. But if you like disappointment, and people really do, sure. we are giving our listeners an incredible opportunity to see us live. Yeah. You get to see us. See us. View yes. us. Right. From the comfort of your own home. Yes. Anywhere. Anywhere in the world. Come turn us on. And, yeah. Uh, and give it a watch, and yeah. it's what, and then so it'll be on demand for a little while after, mm-hmm. after we uh, record. So if you miss it, don't worry. It's your chance to see us live. We're going to talk about a really great topic involving uh, the the real life quest to create super soldiers with our good buddy Mark Brady of Hummies VR Comedy. So nice. it's going to be a blast. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Check us out March second, eight p.m. Thursday. Tickets ten dollars. You can buy tickets at moment.co slash cbm okay i'll do it yeah. awesome we'll yeah, see you well, there you don't have to buy tickets to your own oh, show i don't have to do that okay yeah. well oh, so you know what you look like and you probably wouldn't do that <laughs> no same <laughs> same <laughs> no. me neither no, i don't even have any mirrors in my house <laughs> Jeez. all right <laughs> we'll see you on march 2nd peace welcome to conspiracy beer me i'm justin i'm shane and you are listening to the podcast that is making conspiracies fun again yeah Today, uh, the topic is don't let your time do you. Mm. The bizarre theory linking private prisons to hip hop culture. Oh boy, we're getting into it. Yeah, it's a real, right. it's a deal sent to us by. Oh yeah, let me one pull of our that patrons. Up. Yeah, and uh, so if you're a patron and you have a topic that you'd like us to cover, we do take those. You get to send them to us via the Patreon. And if uh, we like it, we'll uh, we'll we'll do it, and then we'll shout you out with Shane. Yeah. So Carlos. Uh, oh wait, it's, it's a different guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for nothing, Carlos. Yeah. Fuck you. No, Carlos might be coming to our. Uh, oh, he might be coming to live. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Brandon uh, recommended mm. this. Uh, so thank you, Brandon. Good guy. Good guy, Brandon. Yep. And uh, he sent us a few links about this. So that's I'm really excited for this. Also, he uh, this is a great question. He said, "Have you ever had Bojangles?" And I'm the, like, the, hell the, yeah. The chicken. Yeah. I'm like, hell yeah. Dude. A lot. It's awesome. Listen, if you ever meet anybody from North Carolina, specifically Raleigh, but I would say North Carolina, mm-hmm. who's lived here, I'll say a year. Yeah. And they're like, do you ever eat Bojangles? And they say no. They did not live in North Carolina. No, they're full of shit. They're full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way you can live here for a year. No. And not Unless have Unless you're vegan. vegan. And, uh, yeah. Even if you're a vegan, you, you got to get in your mouth. Yeah. Um, the reason why he asked this, <laughs> the reason why he said, uh, my kids uh, are obsessed with chicken sandwiches, and they like can't get Bojangles out west where they live. What, does he want us to send drop No, I, I looked into it. He didn't want that, but I looked into it, and oh. it's impossible. Um, it's really yeah, hard. Dude, what, do, what do we look like? I can't even send hats that I have <laughs> I in know. my car. I'm pretty good about sending stuff, but I don't promise things I can't do. Dude, yeah. Um, but, then, but then, this is perfect for Tab, uh, who is our guest. Um, he also said, I love Little Brother. My favorite hip hop group. I want to catch them live, and I was like, "Well, there are a lot of good people in this area. That's yeah. awesome. Hell so yeah, that's cool." So yeah. yeah, this one, this one's for you, Brandon. Thanks for the topic. This is gonna be great. Yeah, well, that's a great, uh, great way to uh, one thank Brandon, tell mm-hmm. you to join the patrons. Not that much money, uh, but also to bring in our guest, who uh, Shane just mentioned. He's the second time on the show. Uh, he's from Raleigh, North Carolina. He is uh, a hip hop artist. Please welcome back to the show, Tab One. How you doing? I'm doing great. Good. Good to be back. Hell yeah. And you, I was excited when I got the, oh, the message from you. And we're yeah. excited. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, you were Especially great last time. So. Because uh, Brandon uh, suggested this uh, this hip-hop related conspiracy theory, which uh, I dug I dug deep into. And I have to tell you, like it, it it's fascinating because it, it takes me down a memory lane. Um, I don't know when you started, like what era of hip hop do you most associate with like uh what, what it influenced I you the most associate um, heavily influenced by like uh early mid 90s er, okay perfect so like you know per- this is yeah. great cuz yeah. i'm more influenced by mid 80s into 90s run like dmc krs1 yep so you That's probably right. love the grammys you probably lost your mind I mean, it was our. I mean, you didn't like seeing all those old old heads. Perform? I, I do. It it it's a little bit like 
theater? Like seeing a punk band at a casino or something. <laughs> oh, right, You're like, yeah. oh, great. Yeah, like, this <laughs> yeah. is not what I, why I enjoyed this to begin <laughs> right, with, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, to step back, the reason that it's important, because timeline gets kind of critical here, uh, but there is a, a conspiracy theory uh, involved with a, a somewhat anonymous email is the root of it all. Uh, and it and it sort of twists two extremely American institutions, one being our penal system, which is, I think, incredibly unique throughout mm. the world. Like, no one incarcerates people as frequently and for as long as we do. Oh, like sure. We do. Yeah. yeah. We do that we, shit. We are great yeah. at yeah. putting <laughs> yeah. people in jail. Yeah. Uh, and then also the, the culture of hip-hop, which I know that... that all music, to some sense, is derivative, um, and there are other uniquely American musical genres. But like rock and roll, which grew out of uh, another form of uh, predominantly African American music, mm-hmm. I mean, it was heavily influenced by the British invasion too. So it's not, it's not as American, I think, as hip hop is. Sure. Okay. I mean, I would, I would think that it might be the only. Uh, American music genre that came from like no quote unquote instruments. Yeah, right. Like oh, it yeah. was built upon turntables and that. Yeah, that's right. And drum machines and and certainly yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fast. It's a. Vi- I think it's it's and, the co- and then it pulls it, it a lot. Sampling is a big part of it too. Mm-hmm. So right. it's actually pulling from all these genres that already existed. Right, and right. Created its own thing. So. Yeah, it's uniquely American to me in mm-hmm. a way. And I, I should also say, like, I'm not a huge hip hop aficionado. Like, I don't know it. I know, like, I know the big names, and I listen to a lot of hip hop. Yeah. Um. And I was a DJ at the college radio station WKNC in college, okay. and they had Underground 88. Yeah. And I DJed it, but I was just playing what a music director right. had said, this song's good, and you just sort of mix it. And How much older than you was he? It's like the same age. Oh, okay. He wasn't like a 90-year-old tastemaker. <laughs> no, he was just a guy. <laughs> he was just a guy that knew up-and-coming rap artists mm. in the way that I knew up-and-coming like sure. alternative okay. you know, college music. Okay, you yeah. know. So I did. I was exposed to. I just don't know the ins and outs of it. And there's right, periods, right. there's chunks of hip hop that I didn't follow at mm-hmm. all. Like I'm not. I don't know Biggie's catalog of work. Oh wow! Well. Not like well, some of my peers. Unfortunately, do. it didn't last very long. So yeah, yeah. You've probably heard most of it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Would, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. And but, even even artists <clears throat> that have huge catalogs. So say the Beatles, you can listen to. It. The Beatles in an afternoon on Spotify or whatever you listen yeah, that's to. So true. it's like even though they and obviously with mixtapes and things like that, there's probably a larger breadth of things that is yeah, probably yeah, available yeah. for a lot of hip hop yeah. than there is like rock and roll and things like that. But. Yeah, that's a good point. But I can't like I a hip hop song doesn't come on and I'm imme- like I have friends that like immediately know the artist and then usually every single lyric. Sure. Like, I'm not now, now I'm just putting that out there because we're going to talk about some stuff, and anyone jump in and correct <laughs> yeah, me. Where disclaimer. You're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> don't kill, don't kill now, me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the story, uh, I guess you could say it begins in the '70s, which is where hip hop was born in Brooklyn neighborhoods as part of a, a South Bro- Bronx. South Bronx. Yeah, there was. This is why. Yeah, it's so DJ Cohort. Yeah, that's at right. A uh, uh, back to school party. Yeah, at a nice. back to school party. Mm-hmm. Um, the term hip hop, I think, was invented later by a DJ who was describing soldiers marching, and it it, it was more than just rap music. It hmm. was a culture, right? It included break dancing and yeah. graffiti and a certain you know swagger to the whole mm-hmm. you know the whole thing. And it was, and it was very countercultural, which makes sense because uh, Brooklyn and but the Bronx, especially maybe even today, more is a gritty town. It's a mm-hmm. gritty part of New York, and even especially at that time, that time oh, yeah, it was yeah. extremely gritty. Yeah, so have you were, seen Basketball <clears throat> Diaries? Did you ever see that movie? Yeah, uh, they would show like they look like war zones, and that was like yeah, 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 no, like no. places in New York where they it was just oh yeah, just like insane, yeah. 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 And, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I was like, oh my god, that's what America right. looked like back then. It's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I went to New York City in 1986 or seven for the first time. Okay. Stayed in a hotel on Times Square. Back when they still had like the dirty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Went to like the, the, like the bottom floor of our hotel had a 
convenience store attached to it that you could enter from the hotel or from the outside. So like we could, we had permission to go there and get like snacks and stuff. Sure. In line, like six foot two, like prostitute. Like you guys want some company tonight? Like that's unthinkable in New York at this point. <laughs> at least in like, Times yeah. Square, yeah. Now it's Mickey Mouse saying it. Yeah, yeah. no, you're right. M&M <laughs> store. <laughs> <It's another>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were, it was seedy. I, it was seedy then. And, yeah. and, and the Bronx was even seedier. Poor, predominantly black, predominantly Latino neighborhoods is where hip hop culture was born. Absolutely. And then in 1979, um, Sugar Hill Gang had the first commercially successful hip hop song, uh, Rapper's Delight. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the first time that hip hop had this sort of commercial viability. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the 80s, I think uh, is when hip hop became a somewhat of a commercial enterprise. And that's when I started listening to hip hop uh, was in that early period. Now, early on hip hop music's themes were, were very diverse. Mm-hmm. There was the party type hip hop, which was a nod to its party roots of drugs and sex and all the stuff that you think of like a good hip hop song. That's about just kind of, yeah you know which is music sure but there was also an extremely militant political side of hip-hop that grew up in the 80s and that's what i was first exposed to were like public enemy oh yeah okay like for me like high school public enemy and nwa and we were suburban white kids yeah we were listening and playing to live crew public enemy <laughs> and you know we i remember driving down to the beach with the radio blaring with the fuck the police song playing sure. as loud as we possibly could yeah as white kids from Cary, north carolina <laughs> yeah yeah in like 89 yeah you know so yeah well i was listening to the same stuff in south dakota and yeah that's what i was about yeah. to say i was like that's that and that was happening all over the country yeah right was that with the <clears throat> like the rise of mtv that caused that or is that just, oh, absolutely. I would think I would so, think yeah. it would have to be, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how I remember getting it. Like, I remember Run DMC Aerosmith video. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, was big. like one of the earliest things I yeah. remember seeing and LL Cool J and, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I just want to, you know, for those listening who were not listening to, to – there was, there, was, there was somewhat of a lot going on because there was things like DJ Jazzy – Jeff and Fresh Prince yeah, and that was huge you know too. MC Hammer. Yeah. You can't. There was that side, and then there was this other sort of side of hip hop. But that what I'm trying to say is that other side, the more less poppy but more authentic hip hop, could be extremely militant. Mm. I mean mm-hmm. the the Grandmaster Flash classic from 1982, like the message, is all about sort of growing up in the jungle. He calls it of, of inner city neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, even when I think about like uh, uh, Ice Cube, today was a good day. Oh yeah, like yeah. classic song. And to one degree, it's not militant. It's just life in South Central LA, and that was all that West Coast stuff that started coming to the East. Mm-hmm. But then, like at some point in your life, you realize, like, oh, I, now I get what he's trying to tell me. A good day for him was just not dying. Yeah, which is great. not getting pulled over by the police. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. So and he, like, Ice Cube wrote a lot of the lyrics for the NWA stuff too. He did. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And and there was I know, but somehow, even in the eighties when hip hop culture was was becoming influential into the suburbs for guys like me, there was still a political side to it. Mm-hmm. Um. And now and I'm setting this up because. Something uh, seemingly shifts. Yeah. Uh, that we're going to... Yeah, like hard. Rapper's Delight talked a lot about uh, some mom's bad cooking. And yeah. then it changed very quickly to uh, like what you're talking about. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like a... First of all, it was long as shit. It was yeah. Like <laughs> fucking 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's yeah. 14 something. And uh, all yeah. those guys, I don't think any of those guys actually wrote the raps. It was... Um, oh, really? Grandmaster Kaz wrote... I hope I'm not getting that wrong. But I think it was Kaz who wrote at least one of those verses, and uh, those guys like worked at a pizza shop or something. Oh, really? And the lady that started that label kind of saw what was going on with with hip hop, and was the first to actually just take guys do a well recorded oh wow song 
And then that song blew up. Crazy. So a lot of like the real hip hop guys from New York were like, fuck these yeah, guys. Yeah, fuck these dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I get, I, I, like, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> and that's not, I mean, that's sort of common for all, you know, sort of underground music movements. You know, they have that. I call it the punk rock phase because that's where I was first yeah. exposed to it. And mm-hmm. then as that becomes more mainstream, yeah, when you go from like Black Flag to, to Green, Green Day. Day. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're like, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, mm-hmm. shit, this kind of yeah. sucks now. That's yeah. not what I... Well, so I think in some ways, just to be clear, that I grew up as a skater in Florida and we were we thought of ourselves as rebellious sure. and counterculture. And then bands like the Beastie Boys, who were once like kind of a skate punk band, started doing hip-hop. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it somehow seemed like a good transition somehow. Yeah. Well, you those know? scenes, those scenes kind of got along with each other because they were both counterculture and. Right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've heard like uh, the Beastie Boys talk about like just being in the punk scene and then hanging out with the hip hop kids and just becoming like enamored with this new. Right. Right. Style of music. So. Yeah, they, they seemed, it doesn't seem as unnatural. I mean, it felt very normal when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, in the backdrop of all this, something was going on, which I didn't really understand because I was a white kid growing up in suburbia. But the the Reagan administration in 1980, 81, when they came into office, began what was the unofficial war on poverty in the United States. Mm. I mean, we, the war on drugs was already like an official policy. There was an unwritten policy that was the war on poverty okay and reagan and his policies just attacked the inner city like he like like i never was aware of I oh mean, yeah they, i don't think any of us knew when we yeah were i mean they were that. literally yeah. flooding inner cities with drugs mm-hmm. creating drug penalties that were outrageous criminalizing the drugs that were most likely to be used in poor communities while cocaine ran rampant on wall street and across you know in the wealthier mm-hmm. neighborhoods and they just threw people in jail, and it just became. I mean, they were targeted uh, during this time period. For you know, most of the '80s was a real devastating war on the inner cities. Was that Ronald Reagan's idea, or was it his people that were like, "Oh, this is what we should do"? And then Reagan was like, "Well, I guess." Well, probably the other, <laughs> probably the people's <laughs> idea. Yeah, right. Like Reagan was always just some exact figurehead. Yeah, he's yeah, just cop. that yeah. dumb I mean, he's a Hollywood guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, tell me what you want. Me. Yeah, yeah. Liberal say it. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Well, yeah. yeah. White lines? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think he, I don't know that he did, but and this I, was the tough yeah. on crime era. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which really meant tough on inner cities where mostly minorities. Yeah. I like how they always call it a war. On, right, yeah, yeah. Like poverty's <laughs> yeah. On the yeah, other yeah. enemy lines with yeah. fucking guns and poverty's like you'll never <laughs> yeah, exactly. take us alive. <laughs> it's crazy because the they the, if they're poor you probably have less guns. Yeah, they have no, they no guns. <laughs> yeah, what no kind guns. of war is this? Yeah, how about the aid to poverty? Yeah, yeah exactly. Ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a it was a brutal time, and then these forces come together, um, supposedly, allegedly, in nineteen ninety one. In the most bizarre way. Now, this was an anonymous email written that then was published on numerous message boards, which has been the subject of uh, much discussion. I think it's just recently started to pick up some national attention. Like I read an NPR article on it, and I read a oh, wow. uh, a Globe article on it. So, like some major news outlets have covered it. Um, this letter is still considered conspiratorial because the the author sort of like. Sent it and then just sort of disappeared into the night. Okay, was ne- I think I've. Have you, read, have you heard? I think of this? I've read this, but well, the uh, he claims that after twenty or so years, decided to come clean about something that happened in 1991, and he tells the story of he and about thirty other record executives. Most he said were familiar faces were invited to a party at an L.A. mansion, and. They all show up and they're kind of, you know what this is about? I'm like, nah, I don't know what this is about. But uh, they guy comes out and who's running the meeting, obviously, and he says, we got something for you. You got to sign this confidentiality non-disclosure agreement or leave. 
right? And, you know, that's the best way to get people to sign it, is tease people with this sure, idea. Yeah. Like, we got yeah. something good, but we can't, t- you got to sign yeah. this first. And <laughs> yeah. So, like, now everybody's like, some people were like, I'm signing it because I'm pissed that you brought me out here for this. Some mm-hmm. people are like, I'm super curious what this is all about. So they all sign and it. And they assumed it's music based or like maybe it's like a well, new they're all group. music industry, but we don't know uh, these guys yeah. who, who invited us here. So what's going on? Okay. So um, they bring them in. And uh, so they they meet and they basically, when they, they say that the people that own the record industry, the, the shareholders, which is largely these hedge funds like Vanguard and BlackRock. Okay. They've invested heavily in the private prison system. Hmm. And we want you guys to help us. And as a reward, we're going to let you buy shares of this private, you know, publicly traded company that's going to start investing in the private prison business. Hmm. Now, private prisons first one opened in Kentucky in 1986. So by 1991, private prisons were not, they're still not a big part of the penitentiary system. Oh, they're like, not? I thought they were rampant. Well, I thought that too. And they are rampant, but for mm. a specific population. They only mm. they only incarcerate about 10% of all prisoners are in private prisons. Oh, okay. Um, privately run. At least that's what I read. If some, if I'm wrong, somebody... So is it like the best of the best? It's like an yeah. elite school? It is. It's the ones... It's the most lucrative. It's like charter schools. It's why like my brother... Uh, hated charter schools. I think mm-hmm. now he works for a charter school. No, probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, it's fine. Like, <laughs> when he was in regular public school, he hated <laughs> charter schools. They all did because yeah. they're like charter schools cherry pick the best students, mm-hmm. and they get all their funding. And then when every time a kid's a problem, they just kick them back to public school, oh. and they keep mm. the funding for that kid, even though they don't have them. Man, anymore. I gotta start a school. And then they and then <laughs> yeah. they get great test scores and we get all the rejects. You yeah. didn't call it students rejects, <laughs> yeah. by the way. Um, I thought you were gonna say the other reword. Yeah, no, whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah. Whoa, 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 yeah, not all right. Uh, uh, I said rejected, <laughs> rejected. Uh, no, they, they they but they get they get the students that are harder to teach, et cetera, et cetera. And so yeah. it makes charter schools look like. There are these great things, and, and it's like in reality, they're just cherry-picking the best students. Right. And that's kind of what these private prisons did, or okay. still do. But to make all this work, the contracts which they require required that the prisons be like 90% capacity for the entire duration of the private contract. Hmm. Okay. Mm. The, the, other, the other side. So to, to pull this all off and to make money, they needed prisoners to be to be in prison and stay in prison yeah that's the problem yeah that is the problem and so now you can kind of see what's about to happen with the rap music but before we get there like that's that all what i just said is is true about private prisons yeah private prisons to some degree are hugely problematic in terms of the the fairness of them Mm -hmm. people that are in private prisons stay there for longer they're Mm -hmm. less likely to get parole didn't they just recently have like a campaign that like was successful in shutting them down? Aren't they shutting them down then? Some well, it's all state based. Okay, but there's always going to be a state. Is there a, like a certain class of criminal that it, it's it's is it's low drawn to, or that they seek for private prisons? Yeah, it's it's low violence. Like okay. it's not hardened criminals. It's the it's like drug offenders and. Yeah, well, non-violent, not, maybe non- not trafficking, but like yeah, non-violent drug offenders, yeah. people who aren't recidivists, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, but here's the thing: in order to have enough people to put in the prison, they need the other prison to be full. Oh, okay. So they need because like the need for private prisons oh, okay. essentially, yeah. and this was true because in the '80s our prisons were overflowing, like the war on drugs and poverty. The unintended consequence was that our prison populations were swelling. Hmm. Like every time we have tough on crime, the penitentiary system just gets overflowed. Yeah. I mean, three strikes and you're out is a terrible rule from a from a, a penal system point of view because mm-hmm. now you're putting a person who's done three misdemeanors into prison for a long period oh, of time. Right, yeah, yeah it's who? Yeah, it could just be a, it could be a stupid thing and with minimum sentences. And these companies, private prisons, they're the ones that constantly lobby for mandatory minimum sentences of years and stuff because they want yeah. full prisons to then push. Oh wow. The lowest level offenders, the most, the easiest and cheapest to take care of, 
So then you think about it, and it's like, well, look at our prisons compared to yours. Our prisoners, right? They they get their oh, degrees. Yeah. They they get you know they have a you know you know we do a better job of correcting prisoners in our private prisons. So give us more money, give us more prisoners, hmm. make more money. And really, in reality, is they're they're creating the system that benefits them. Wild, what a racket! Well, hmm. yeah, that's a racket. Yeah. That's not even the conspiracy. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the, it's just facts. that's the yeah, that's facts. the worst part. Yeah, yeah. The conspiracy is that at this meeting with like thirty record executives, the people were like the same people that own these prisons also own record label stock, uh, most of it, hmm. and we want you to shift the culture of hip hop into a culture that celebrates violence and gangs so that criminality will be entrenched inside the inner cities. Mm. And so it will continue to mm. keep our prison population, what we need it in order for these to be profitable and and, in exchange and for hip hop was the sole target of that. That's that, that's a good question. Cause I, we're going to talk about a, uh, a criticism I read of this theory. But uh, okay. but it was a big it was yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as far as it, its influence in the inner city, I yeah. think the idea that was presented at this meeting was like as long as a is a regular kid growing up in the inner city thinks that his only option is to play professional sports or join a gang, then that's going to keep the prison population what we need to make a ton of money off of. Right. Wow. Hmm. So they pitched this to these people and four guys at the meeting were like, do you, are you even fucking listening to yourself? Like, well, that's good. Do we know their names? Well, this the guy, one of the guys that wrote the email. So oh, okay. we, like four of us were like, I'm out. I don't care. And they're like, you sign an agreement though. And they're like, well, I didn't, I don't agree to this. Yeah. They're like, but you can't talk about it. And so they, mm. the guns were drawn. Like they were kicked out of the meeting. They were followed off the premise in the property. And then the guy goes on to say, like, I, you know, I was racked with guilt. I, re- I quit the music industry, like, a hmm. few months later. Thought about contacting the other guys who walked out with me, but never did. Yeah. But he's like, as I listened to hip-hop in the 90s, I could tell hmm. that what was happening was the change was occurring. That, like, there was less of that political, militant, you know, fuck the police. Yeah, I was trying to think, like, what was out around... You said this is 91? Yeah, this is 91 when, so it, when it started Public happening. Enemy had already been out, right? Mm-hmm. Public Enemy was already out. Yeah. And the, it, new, the new stuff that was coming out after that, um, and I had, um, I lost my list of examples that this article gave. of like, But it, I think that gangster rap, which I think, again, the term gangster rap probably goes back into the late 80s mm-hmm. more, but like I think that... that it does some in some degree predominate the the genre to at least at least yeah, in it, how people no, think it, about it. It took over. It took over pretty yeah. And it and I mean there there even in this day I think there is a there's a perception of rap music both from within and from without. I mean even people within rap music say, are say yeah like what are we what are we rapping about at this point? Like, right. What are we like what are we getting people to think about or. Yeah. What's the platform for? And I know there are exceptions to people that do rap about just their life, whatever that, but I mean, Eminem to some degree yeah. raps about, and that's probably a, a, a strange example, but he did grow up in a sure, poor yeah. community in Detroit. And there are other people that I think rap in a similar way, but gosh, most of the stuff today is either about fucking or, I mean, wet ass pussy. If that's hip hop, it's not a really, it's not really a militant political song, nor is it gangster rap. But I guess there's absolutely nothing that's in like like Public Enemy was the mainstream. Yeah, like there's nothing in the mainstream now that is pushing any sort of what I would say positivity or any kind of positive message. And then, uh, I mean, it, it even goes beyond just the lyrics in the songs like if you get into like how s- sound f- certain frequencies and sound oh, yeah. waves affect mm. uh you know people's actions and emotions uh there's studies that have looked into that too i think i think kanye talked about i mean kanye yeah yeah kanye I mean, said a lot of shit lately but <laughs> yeah. uh he's not off on that 
that yeah. thing where he talks about that's the sound frequencies. Yeah, and we talked about that with that Travis Scott episode, just mm-hmm. how like how you know what happened in the crowd is that just a, a byproduct of like sub frequencies that you don't understand. Right. And we even posted a video shortly after that that showed um how particles reacted when certain frequencies were played. And yeah, so cymatics. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so crazy. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. Yeah. That, that is, you know what? It, it, I guess the part that, that is striking to me is that when, I, when we, we're sitting here talking about it, I'm realizing like how I think of hip-hop now versus how I thought of it in the, in the 80s when there was still this cultural war going on, this sort of war for the inner city, like now I just think about it in terms of like, like drinking and drugs and shooting and violence and all that stuff. It doesn't even bother me. Like I'm, I'm sort of numb to it all. Yeah. I don't even really think about it, mm-hmm. but probably that's partly because I'm a still a suburban white guy. Right. Yeah. 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 It yeah, doesn't yeah. affect you. No, yeah. I was actually I was watching an interview today with uh, this rapper uh, Vince Staples. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was talking about how uh, I mean, uh, people make money off of black trauma. Absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah. Right. Right. Like we people from outsiders see it as entertainment, and they mm-hmm. forget that there's real people behind that who are. Like you're listening to it like you're watching a TV show or a movie. They're living through that shit. Yeah. Daily. Yeah. Right. Um. So and it's it's become this way to make money. Yeah. Really, what my question would be like after this meeting, like how do they follow through with that plan as far as like influencing the artists to make that type of music? Would it be more that they only buy or look for artists that or yeah. that buy, you know, albums or produce albums that are in that vein versus saying like, say someone came with a positive message and they're like, yeah, I'm sorry, that doesn't work anymore. Sorry, you got to give us something else, yeah. you know? Right. That's what I assume, but I don't know. Well, they put a lot of, they put the machine behind. Exactly, yeah. A yeah. specific type of song and then artists who want to make it, mm-hmm. say, well, that that works. Right, so exactly. So let's do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and then it that causes seems a right. shift. Yeah, yeah for sure. Because there's been there's been uh, a lot of stories over the the past twenty thirty years of rappers who at some point had great, gained some fame, and people were like, "Yeah, they weren't really as hard as, as they make it out to yeah, be." Yeah. They they sort of fabricated yeah. or played up their like their their inner city roots or their gangster like Ja Rule. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, yeah. I've heard Fifty talk about. Ja Rule's how they tried to like mold him into this gangster rapper when it really I, I think he went to a fairly nice school and right like, yeah was uh you know probably not rich but like not poor by any means I could be speaking I was never Neither really got do. into Ja Rule yeah yeah <laughs> um but uh, yeah yeah I mean I could definitely see that right yeah I think that and you know when you look in areas you go to areas where you're sort of celebrating yeah that that hardness yeah that it, you know it's it's a very uh it's a definitely a definitely a portrayal of masculinity that i associate with that with the genre like sometimes starting in the mid 90s yeah um mm-hmm. and and i know again i know there's exceptions to all of this and a lot of times like yeah, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite rap albums oddly enough of the last 20 something years is the guy, the streets, the oh, British yeah. rapper, which is just so bizarre and <laughs> just so different. Cause it's just about a British dude. It really doesn't sound very good, but it's like, so there are, <laughs> there are, I love it by the way. Yeah, if he's yeah. listening. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he probably <laughs> message us. Uh, he was on the, uh, they, ha- I think they had his name on the, um, at the Grammys on the wall. Oh, did oh, they? Nice. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah, dude, that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, look, real quick, the, and this probably could be a final thought, but it, uh, we're not there yet. But this is interesting. So you sent the article today about TikTok, um, mm. how they reward people that do a certain thing right when they join the platform and they push your stuff. But eventually yeah. you have to pay for it, right? So Shittification. Shittification. That's what the which, guy called it. It's which, a, it's honestly, a, this is basically a, a longer, more analog version of that. So the music industry is like, this This is going to sell. We're just going to keep pushing this. You know, it's it's... The music machine, just the way TikTok's a machine, or 
Instagram's machine. It's going to push the algorithm's going to push what they think works or what they right. think people are going right. to buy more. And unfortunately, we as consumers keep buying that. Well, so. that, you're right. It, to even make a finer point, I think, is that if you believe the allegations in the email, mm-hmm. they said hip hop is going to be a huge commercial money maker in the next, you know, three decades. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you push it to where it celebrates a violent culture and makes gangsters seem like heroes, it's also going to make this other industry Mm. profitable because it's going to continue to keep our incarceration rates at ridiculous levels. Right. And so if you do that, we're giving you a choice. In in exchange for doing that, we're going to allow you to buy stock in these companies which are going to buy invest majorly in these private prisons and make a huge killing. And that's your incentive to do this. And, and so it, you're right. It is like, we're going to make you a lot of money, but it's not like we're going to make you a lot of money by making this kind of music that we think is really valuable. It's like, right. It's definitely, you, we, they could have said, we want you to push, yeah. we want you to push the rap that is creating change. Right. Right. Like the, the, the analogy for me is, is, is born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen, mm-hmm. which Bruce Springsteen, was a rebellious folk singer from New Jersey that looked around and was like, like I was born in the USA. This sucks. Yeah. And right? everyone thinks it's an anthem for American. Yeah. Right. Like, right. right. When but you listen to the verses, you're like, wait a second. Well, yeah. Like, <laughs> what? First what? kick I got <laughs> yeah. was when I hit the ground. Yeah. I grew up in a like deadbeat town. First kick I got was when I hit the ground. Like sent me off to the uh, Vietnam, yeah, yeah. kill the yellow man, put mm-hmm. a gun in my hand. It's like, it's a really yeah. brutally rebellious song. But yeah. Like we can't have we can't have people in New Jersey getting worked up and possibly <laughs> right. overthrowing the government. So let's make it a patriotic song. Interesting. And mm-hmm. it's like this is another form of like we can't have hip hop becoming a way for black people to to talk about the inherent unfairness of their communities. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. That's not yeah. that's not going to work. Can't, yeah. Can't have them informing their communities about what's really going on. Right, right. Yeah. How we can make things better. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, that's kind of a trap too, because if you're one of those artists, you're like, well, I need to pay bills or I need to do this. Of course, I'm going to do the thing that's going to get abs- me paid. Uh, absolutely. Know, which is unfortunate. Right. You know, you're just perpetuating the. Yeah. And, and I do understand, and this is an article that I was talking with Shane about before the pod, that one guy criticized it because he feels like, all this does is bring us to this chicken and egg scenario where it's like, does does society create the music or does music shape and create society? And that in some ways is an unanswerable question mm. because they work together. Probably both. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, and by, by focusing on this debate, we're still not doing anything about the inner cities, which are still in turmoil in many ways. And the incarceration yeah. rates are still too high. So he sees this conspiracy as a distraction mm. And, I, and I'll, I'll admit that I, I get that. I mean, point. all conspiracies are a distraction from. Well, we live in a mostly. shitty world, yeah, yeah. so it's like. Mm-hmm. But if if you listen to this and think, well, maybe the decisions that record labels make about what music gets made has more political motivation, then that's I think worth thinking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is the do media? Yeah, it's yeah. Are these record labels there to shape the direction of culture? Uh, which is a huge question. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's wild, man. And they, they keep getting monopolized. Like all, there used to be so many major labels and now there's probably what, like three or four. Yeah. Yeah. Warner Universal. Brothers, Universal and Sony own 90% of the, of hip hop albums. Wow. Yeah. Um, two companies, Core Civic uh, and Geo Group own over 90% of all privately held prison beds in the United States of America. Hmm. Those two companies are almost entirely owned by the same two hedge groups, Vanguard and BlackRock. Crazy. So the people that own (laughs) hip hop are the same people that own private prisons. I played a game recently. If you go on Yahoo finance and pick any fortune 500 company, Guess who the top two shareholders Vanguard are? Vanguard and BlackRock. Yeah, crazy. It's fucking scary. Yeah, they're they're a massively and powerful companies that have huge influence. I think on what, um, what kind of media, what mm-hmm. what life is yeah. like on a day to day basis, and their main goal is what's most profitable. Mm-hmm. And 
I don't think the powers that be want to have really salient, powerful protest music of any shape or form. They yeah, certainly yeah. don't want inner city musicians creating music that somehow awakens in a white suburban kid in 1986 an understanding of like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got a letter from the government the other day, opened it, read it, said they were suckers, they wanted me for the army or whatever, picture me giving a damn. I said, never. Like, yeah. that hit me as a white kid. Is that from Born in the USA? No. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, no, I'm a black absolutely. man. I can never be a veteran. Okay, okay. it's public enemy, of course. Uh, yeah, Elvis was a hero the most, but he never meant shit to me. Yeah, like most white kids, like, what's wrong with Elvis? Right, right. No, right, you yeah, were like, exactly. Yeah, and then you started, It was an eye opener. Yeah, it's just like a lot of the good hip hop that I grew up. I mean, that's I listened to a lot of shit like that too. Um, for me, it was. I mean, I I kind of miss Public Enemy. As a kid, I was a little bit younger, but um, I mean, like Black Star came along. Black like Star was most great. Most definitely, Quali. Um, yeah. Tribe called Quest was a Tribe De La, like yeah, like in thought provoking. Yeah, rest in peace to Dave. Um, just thought provoking hip hop like, mm-hmm. that would raise questions and talk about issues that. You know, same thing. Right. White kid from suburbs, like I okay. Yeah. This is interesting. And then I, you know, listen to the lyrics over and over again. You want to know like what are these references and you start looking up stuff and like you can become informed. Yeah. I mean that's hip hop's powerful that way. And I feel yeah. like that stuff broke through, right? I feel like I think it's kind of the way like pop music, like maybe gangster rap was the pop music of that that you know that genre being sold and then there's like that stuff with like hip hop like you know, like Daylight yeah, like, like where it's like, like that tribe was, and that stuff yeah. was and Daylight was like the the antithesis of, of the gangster rap exactly, at, the, yeah. at the time. Mm-hmm. And it but it was never it never had the commercial success. No, that, no, no. Right. You no. know, Dre and Snoop and all them had. Yeah. And yeah. I love that stuff too. Um yeah. Yeah it, it, I I I'm struck by this this whole conspiracy one, uh, which we didn't really talk about is that if I'm ever like called to a secret meeting in a mansion in LA <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you got to sign it. I'm not disclosing. I'm, no. I'm gone. I'm not fucking <laughs> yeah. signing. Yeah. This is an eyes wide shut situation. I'm not for sure. fucking yeah. signing that exactly. at all. You yeah. know what I mean? Like once you I'm come not. in this door, you can't leave. Like yeah. I'm not yeah. coming in that door. Yeah. The minute you sign this, your mouth stays open. You're like, why? But, no. what, yeah. what are you putting yeah. in there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, Somebody sits down with me and says, "Hey, just mere formality. We got to before I can yeah. sell this to you. I got to. You have to sign this. Okay, fine. But if it's like that scenario where I'm yeah. like, Good Nights has a meeting and there's like all <laughs> yeah. thirty comics there and they're like, Okay, guys, once you sign this, yeah, you cannot say anything else yeah. about what happened. I'm going to be like, I'm out. I don't know what you're about to tell me. Yeah, yeah. So, I I mean, I think whether this happened or not, it's still kind of true." If, yeah. Yes. Yes. As far as what has happened, that like that's, these yes. labels obviously know what sells. They're gonna push that shit. That shit does influence culture. Unfortunately, it has negative effects sometimes, and that leads to filling up these prisons. Like, yeah, that's cor- yes. Why is it that the bad scenario always sells more? Like, why can't people make? Because people, uh, it's like watching a train wreck yeah right yeah i don't know yeah that's true yeah it's, it's sad, shot in Freud, right? right but i i i think it's also because we get shown that more true yeah and pushed that more like if we saw like i follow it's like the good news movement on oh, yeah. instagram mm-hmm. i love that page yeah. like if oh, that was cool what one. we see every day yeah maybe you would see a shift yeah but i mean this is why conspiracies exist for some reason mm-hmm. right we that doesn't happen yeah and why is that yeah it is weird because it's also it's and this is a little bit of a, a stretch but like i every time i watch an action film or a film that includes tons of gratuitous violence with guns i'm like why do we think why are we okay with this like <laughs> yeah. this is so weird we're just watching people's heads get blown off we're like yeah that's just yeah. and then yeah, yeah. and then not to say that that necessarily affects what happens in america but it's like well it's not much of a stretch to go from like 
normalizing violence in right. media to normalizing violence, what you put yeah, in your brain that, comes out the other side. They call that pain porn now. Oh yeah, they're like that's a, it's a way to describe a movie like a. I never saw it, but what's the one with DiCaprio where he like gets eaten by a bear or something? Oh, the Revenant. Oh, the Revenant. Revenant. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it either. It's good, but somebody said it's just pain porn. It's just it's just him suffering, suffering for and just it's just like. But oh. I love watching Leo suffer. I've always been a fan. Oh yeah, Basketball yeah. Diaries when he was like oh, trying yeah. to kick heroin. I was like, man, I want to be a heroin addict one day just so I can kick it. Like that's how I thought as a kid, <laughs> and that's good, why yeah. film is Me horrible. And Mark and I liked watching Turn on your TV. Die yeah, Mark and Mark. Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Like, like, just there are times where I'm like, how much longer can people get away with like committing sexual assault for the movie? Yeah, you know what I mean, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, why would we be like, hey, what we want you to do? Yeah, is just do the most horrific thing in the world. Yeah, on camera, but you're gonna be acting. Yeah, no, you got to make it look real. You got to sell. It. It's like, no, don't, no. no don't I told you this that. during the pandemic. I got very few auditions, but the ones I got were. Uh, killer of Emmett Till. I declined that audition. I was like, I do not want to be wow. that. <laughs> I don't want to audition for that. And then the other one I got was a lawyer of person that got the killer of Emmett Till off. I was like, why are you giving me these roles? <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing this. <laughs> I was like, I don't even, even if it's acting, I don't want to play this. Like, I'm not, I'm yeah. not doing this. Yeah, that's not a good role. I mean, like, because if you're too good at it, doesn't it say like? And why do they keep making those? Fu- that's that's another example of like black trauma, like. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, I never saw Moonlight, but apparently Moonlight is like that. Like all these, the slavery movies are like yeah. the big things. Yeah. yeah. Like why? Yeah. I will never. I've said on the pot. I was like, I'll never watch the um, what's the Leo Caprio one? What's the the slave? Uh, oh, that's the uh, Django. Django. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to. I don't need to see yeah. Leonardo say the N word a billion times for yeah, two it's, hours. It's it's a lot. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I don't, and I understand that like. I could go watch a movie that could explain this way yeah. better. I understand if black filmmakers and film producers want to produce a movie yeah. to portray history. Yeah, sure. That. But Quentin Tarantino. Which, <laughs> I know, right? Tarantino? Yeah. yeah. He only wrote Pulp Fiction so he could say the N-word. That's yeah, the only reason. Yeah. He says he, he gets a lot of flack for that, too. Good. And yeah. I, I feel like I've seen his response, but... I, look, I don't, I don't know, know what his response is, but he wrote himself into a cameo appearance. Yeah. Where he says the N word like thirty times in like two minutes. Yeah, there's something like he found like, a loophole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like white guys can say it in a movie, so right. I'm gonna write this character that says it gratuitously, and I'm gonna play it. And then he yeah. wrote Jenga. But I'm just playing a. Character. He just keeps writing. But I'm just playing a character. Yeah, yeah. just playing I'm a like, character. You, yeah, you deserve like, right. hell for that. All right, Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was so. Yeah, I get. I I see where black trauma, white people profiting off black trauma, is problematic. Yeah. The incarceration problem, incredibly problematic. Mm-hmm. And whether it was because of this meaning or whatever, there has been a shift in the hip hop culture. Like from what I remember it as in the 80s mm-hmm. and early 90s to what it is today, mm-hmm. I don't really have a judgment on whether it's better or worse or fair or less fair or necessarily, but it's definitely different and if it means that 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 part of that keeping this violent culture entrenched into our 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 minority communities is somehow to fill our prisons and sell records that's just fucked up yeah is hip hop or the type of rap that we're talking about still violent i don't i don't listen to that so i don't is it still uh i don't yeah i mean there's yeah, for it's sure. Be I mean, a there's genre, there's yeah. like it's called drill music. It's uh, there's these guys that I mean, they literally have they talk shit. That's another thing that the industry has played up is these beef between rappers have, ever, ever beef, since right. like Biggie, yeah. Biggie, Pac thing, like East Coast West Coast thing. Yeah, uh, they push that, and mm-hmm. then it, it's like it's to the point where it's like the labels don't even have to do that anymore. These drill rappers are like taking it upon themselves call out other rappers okay. on Instagram on like IG live or whatever. Sure. And then it, people end up shot. Crazy. Yeah. How come no one shot the Island boys yet? Cause I saw them call <laughs> people out on Instagram one time. Oh, uh, man. Look at that. The Island boys. The Island boys. <laughs> I saw them recently, man. Yeah. You went to their show? <laughs> no, no. It was, a, it was like, uh, no, they were just like, Trying to leave a store and some guy was like, "Oh no, that was oh that they filmed that themselves." 
I thought some guy was like, hey, them boys, and they were getting all mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they probably, like, set up fake scenarios. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's thing, probably yeah. right. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, there's so there's so many different categories. It's like uh, I saw one uh, interview with a guy, and he was just like, just like down and lean on the interview, and he was just like, "That's my life, man. That's all I do." I was like, "That's your life? You just are into lean constantly? You don't do anything but codeine yeah. and fucking yeah? I'm How do like, you even record music? Exactly. I'm like, yeah. I don't get this. Um, yeah. Well, I, I I don't. To your point, I, whether it's violent or not. Which sounds like Tab, you're saying yes. Again, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't I mean know not enough. all of it. No, right. not just yeah. yet. Yeah. It, what it is not is it's not political like it used to be. Like I don't yeah. hear consistently no, no. songs that come out that question the fundamental structure of society as it affects the most vulnerable people. I mean Kendrick. I mean Kendrick does, right? Yeah, Kendrick, Rhapsody. Um I mean there's there's definitely artists out there. Um I mean, even Nipsey Hustle, I you know, if you want to get into conspiracies, I don't know who killed Nipsey, but I mean, I'm sure they pinned it on somebody. But like, Nipsey was a huge advocate of independence. Um, you don't need these labels, right? Community did tons of community work. Like, um, was just like every interview you see with Nipsey, he's teaching, he's trying to teach people like, right, how to do shit themselves. And, you know, uh, give back to your community. And then, I mean, those are the guys that always end up dead. It's like, right. uh, I mean, there's positive shit out there. And I, I think that is the silver lining is like the same way uh, podcasts are kind of like putting major network TV mm -hmm. stations to shame these days. Right. We don't need these fucking labels anymore. Right, yeah, yeah. We don't need these fucking labels anymore. Yeah, okay. you hear that? You can do <laughs> this shit yourself. Yeah. And you can push positive messages or just your story. Your story. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, not everything's going to be positive. Right, But as yeah. long as it's authentic, that's yeah. what people need is just real shit. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think maybe that's the, the, that's the, uh, the rub is not to say that there aren't authentic stories of people who in, in the hip hop community who have histories in prison or in gangs or violence or whatever. Yeah. It's that people that didn't have those stories felt like they had to pretend they did, or at least play up the parts of their lives. Yeah. You know, whether that right. was like, I was a kid, I lived in a bad neighborhood. My parents moved me to the suburbs and I had a, a relatively stable life yeah. with this history that I knew about. Yeah. So I'm just going to play that up because that's what the industry wants. Damn, is that yeah. cultural appropriation? What? If, doing like gang, that? gang culture? Or no, like, just like if you grew up uh, in a in a society or in a part of the world that you didn't have to, those issues, but you take that on as your persona, that would be appropriating think, that yeah. culture, right? I mean, yeah. I think everyone's appropriating some culture to a degree, oh, sure, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, hell, half um, of country music is sung and loved by more than half by people who have never experienced <laughs> yeah. the hardships expressed <laughs> in true. country music. I mean, yeah. It's all a big farce. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But again, that's that true. yeah, but you, to your point, like that's because the labels, right? Because the label yeah. says this is what we want. Yeah. This is the music yeah. that's selling. This is what's hot. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good point. Like you could probably argue the same thing for like pop country music. I mean, yeah. talk about a degradation of... Just yeah. fucking ignorant bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Like But it sells. That's what sells. Yeah. Yeah. And I so yeah, all of that And like, there's been they like uh, if you look at pop country now, it's like it's like they've infused hip hop beats with like twangy Yeah. It's so crazy, yeah. It's and it's the worst shit ever. But <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. It's I don't know, man. These these fucking major labels know what they're doing. And I yeah. guarantee you, they have teams of psychologists and and people telling them like what works, what sure. doesn't. It, and yeah, now they're gonna yeah. just have AI that does it. They'll just be like, "What's the what's the beat that gets me?" Yeah, people? sure. So it is crazy, you know. It, the numbers get sort of dizzying. We're like, uh, one of my friends is a is on tour with Coldplay as a as a roadie. Uh -huh. They did ten shows at Soldier Field. It's kind of like a thing that you do at 10, ten? 10 
in That's a row in a, like yeah it's like a, it's like yeah, a no week. breaks it was like a 20 you do like, 28 you do hour like show. there's two days two days you do like doubles right? yeah that's For crazy real. um paul uh, not paul simon uh uh fucking what's his name country singer that's real real famous oh man name really paul awesome. no garth brooks oh okay. garth, garth yeah, brooks yeah, yeah. did it with i don't know how, but they, they always these things always fucking like probably sold everyone out yeah so that's like fifty thousand seats at one hundred and fifty three dollar average. So that run is worth like eighty million in ticket sales, just ticket sales. Mm-hmm. Insane. Not not merchandise, not yeah. beverages, not parking, not hotel nights. It, it's eighty million dollars in fucking ticket sales. Yeah. So like at that level, there's a ton of money involved, and if two industries say like, you know what, would be great if this rap music. Like if we could continue to promote the violent part, it will help yeah. us with like the judicial reform that we're pushing because, yeah. you know, you hear this narrative for judicial reform about the culture of violence and, you know, being tough on crime and all that shit, which is really born out of what seems like stereotypes that have been pushed by the record industry, mm. right, to sell more mm-hmm. records, right? Yeah. So, you know, fuck off, record labels. <laughs> yeah. 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 Black rock. Well, and the like all the the deals that they sign these artists to are horrible. These horrible. Like huh? Three hundred and sixty deals where they pretty much get a percentage of everything that they do, even ticket sales, even merch, and then like um, they're like locked in for however many albums they have to do. Right. They have to recoup payments, and then like the studio fees that they charge them are like astronomical like it's all just a racket dude yeah and like it's uh, i've seen stories it's like all the money and jewels people are flashing it's all fake it's like they they can't they don't even have they don't make that much money it's like yeah or they'll rent it out yeah exactly they rent out yeah Yeah. it's crazy someone was like oh jay-z was wearing a three million dollar watch at the grammys and i was like actually it's selling for nine million and people are like how do you have a watch that's more than a house more than a mansion it's like well one he doesn't own it it's the uh, <laughs> Patek Philippe gave it to him to wear at the Grammys. Right. He just wears it for clout. And then uh, all stuff that expensive is just to launder money anyway. So, yeah. He's also a billionaire. Not yeah, but, yeah, Jay might. He's the one that he might. That might. But, but yeah. there was also like a, there was a, a theory floating around that like at the time, probably later in the 90s when rap was doing really well. There was like four of the, uh, I think maybe Death Row, Rockefeller. I don't know. There was talk of of black ownership, mm-hmm. right? Black owned labels. No, I've heard this. Yeah, coming together and kind of taking ownership of their shit, and then uh, things kind of fell apart. I mean, that might have been around the time Tupac got shot, right? And Biggie. Hmm. Um, yeah. So I, you know. Who knows? There's probably efforts to stop. <laughs> sure, yeah, and that's from, a, that's an episode too. All own... oh, the Tupac and Biggie. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that, yeah, for sure it is. Yeah, it's all of it. You know, just it. It's the easiest conspiracy to believe because not believing in it doesn't really alter the landscape at all. It's yeah, like, it's not like a. It's 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 like here's this thing that we know, right? It's like we knew about gravity. <laughs> for a long time we just didn't have a, a formula to explain it right and we we know this is true but somebody now says ah oh, there was this email that you know somebody sent anonymously and that explains that there was more complicit yeah you yeah. know action the problem with the email especially an anonymous one is anybody could have just yeah. typed the shit up yeah. i don't yeah, I don't know. It's we not the hardest it. proof. We, it was a long con. We did it. Yeah. We sent that, so, and then also, we just did a podcast on it 20 years later. <laughs> I mean, the guy in the email, you know, he's like, I was racked with guilt, and I finally came clean. Well, then, then fucking sign your name to it. At yeah, least, exactly. At least be yeah. like, you know well, what? Well, it was Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I guess maybe if you have a wife and kids, and your wife's like, is it possible they would kill us? Like, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so there's maybe. always that. But... Then maybe you go to a journalist and you say, I will reveal my name to you anonymously so that you can vouch for sure, the credibility yeah. of this. But don't just like drop it and leave. Yeah. 
I don't know that. That I guess that's my problem with the yeah anonymousness of the email. Yeah, me, me too. Because I think I've read it and I was just like, it all makes sense. But then you're like, well, and it still makes sense. Yeah, but just the whole like right. the actual meeting. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's always so very Maybe. easy to write years later. It's like, oh, this is how this all ties. Like many conspiracies, it's like, well, I've seen, I've been around long enough to see how the pieces could have fall, could have, could have fallen together. I'm yeah. gonna just say that's what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the article, the the criticism I read of it, that person was obviously very much a hip hop scholar, and and he was trying to say there was way more nuance prior to '91 in mm-hmm. hip hop, and there's way more nuance after. But then in my head, and a lot of the comments were like. Well, maybe for you, Mister Scholar, but from the oh, yeah. sure. average yeah, yeah. person, it like, is easier. To, it's easy to say if you know a lot about hip hop and you have your finger on the pulse of every subgenre of hip hop right, right. and what's going on at the time. But just from like average Joe Schmo view of like what's in the mainstream, mm-hmm. there's obviously. I mean, that's it yeah. runs. Yeah. And hip hop is a huge, I mean, it makes, it's influenced everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like from liquor sales to alcohol clothing. sales to jewelry sales to clothing, it right. changed the fashion industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, it changed almost every aspect of culture. Like it's huge. Yeah. Right. I love that story of Dapper Dan. You know Dapper Dan, right? He was like yeah. basically selling clothes with Gucci and all this stuff on it. And then, they r- took all this stuff away. He's like, stop bootlegging our crap, and now he's got to deal with Gucci, and he's just selling. Yeah. It's like, you changed the landscape, and now you're on top. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Yeah, that's cool that they they gave him his, gave him his due. It's giving yeah, me yeah. hope for comedy. For yeah, right. Saying. Yeah. You won't book me, but one day. One day. <laughs> like, Please one do day. our show. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I meant to bring this up earlier. It's just in terms of like just talking about the deals that there are those 360 deals and all these deals where people are getting screwed. Mm-hmm. There's a comedy club, a national comedy club that does this crazy thing that I don't know how they get away with it. They pay you and then you have to pay them back a portion of what they pay you. It's like the craziest like. Why even do that? Exactly. That it's it's clearly thing? some crazy tax scheme, it's got, but it's, it's gotta be. but they've been doing it for years and all the comics are like, well, this is just how it's done. I'm like. What are you talking about? I would yeah. be like, and that's why I'm not a well-known comedian because I care about logistics like this. I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. What? What? Like, well, law that am makes I skirting? no sense. Yeah, yeah. That's that's. I want to. We'll, we'll talk. Yeah, about that's. That I, yeah. yeah, we used to get asked. You know, there's a, like music. They probably do it with comedy too, like showcases. Oh yeah, like yeah. you pay to perform. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Right, yeah. for right. exposure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's always good. yeah. So. I yeah, know. I still exposure still hasn't helped my bank account very much. No. Uh, by the way, uh, you can Venmo us or pay us at the end of the episode. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, all of this. I mean, it seems like we're off topic, but we're not because what we're talking about as you know, older artists who at least have some business acumen and savvy. Where like, I don't think I would get like. If it's a bad deal, I might accept it, but I would accept it knowing full well that it's sure. a bad deal. Sure. Yeah. But if you're someone who <laughs> desperately wants to sell an album or desperately wants a song on the radio, and then someone starts dangling the kind of money that could literally change your life and your family's life, yeah, and escape a bad situation, well, then you're more apt to sign on the line. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. You're just praying yeah, on I the mean, week. It, yeah. yeah. Like. Uh, I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate. So, like, I, I make music because I love it. I have a job that supports my family. So, I don't need to make any drastic decisions, but, yeah. um, nor have I ever been offered them. So, <laughs> uh, so let's make that clear. But yeah, like, for, for, uh, a kid from the inner city who's, you know, desperately trying to improve his life and, uh, his income and help his family out. Uh, or her family out, like, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. hard to turn right. down, you know. Yeah. Somebody's have, dangling that in front of you. Have you obviously you're in the scene? Have you f- experienced people that you know that have taken those deals and you have seen it go bad? Um, no. Well, I mean, I don't. I mean, Little Brothers, uh, they got signed to Atlantic Records, mm-hmm. um, and it just didn't work out because kind of 
well, I mean, it kind of goes to what we're talking about. Like, they just make authentic hip hop music that didn't fall in the lane of, sure. of the kind of stuff we're talking about drugs, guns, yeah. violence. And uh, it just didn't do well commercially. Right. Yeah. So I think the Atlantic dropped them after that. Um, Such a bummer, too, because you like the. You just put all your eggs in one basket yeah. a lot of times, and you expect these people to have yeah. your best interest at heart, I, but they don't. You know. Yeah, when we uh, when I was in influential before Cooley High, we we did a talent show at NC Central, and we were first place was uh, a trip to New York to visit Atlantic Records, and we won, and we, we never we just never never got oh, it. never really? went. They never offered it. Right, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Dang, we were all excited and. And yeah. that was just, yeah. It was just something. I think that they, it was. I think it was just a low level person at Atlantic, and mm. I think they were expecting like one artist who just raps over beats. But we had a full band, so there was four or five of us. Oh yeah. Wow. And they were like, "Yeah, we'll we'll see what we can do." Oh, it took sucks. us to Bahama Breeze. So yeah. I mean, that's all we got. <laughs> oh man, that's yeah. brutal. We got a shitty meal. Oh, and boy. <laughs> you didn't get the coconut shrimp. That's just tight. <laughs> Damn, I don't Bahama know. Breeze. Is that place still that's open? almost like a <laughs> yeah, it's still there. Yeah, it's still. I can't believe that's still open. I know it's crazy. Anyway, well, that place pops well, off man, on the weekend. Uh, final thought. I'll 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 give you my final thought. Uh, prisons are too overcrowded, and the idea that somehow. If you push more and more people into public prisons in order to force the the most lucrative prisoners to a private prison, I don't care if you're using rap music, hip hop culture, or whatever to make that happen. That's fucking wrong. Yeah, for sure. And to the extent that any of this is remotely true, well, it's definitely true that BlackRock and Vanguard own both industries. To be fair. Black Rock is a perfect name for someone to control hip hop. Yes, that is. Yeah, so is Vanguard. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. They both sound like evil. And I mean, they sound like. Something. Oh no, I was more thinking like Black Rock is hip hop. Oh yeah, I wasn't thinking evil. I was just thinking that's a good name for. Uh, it's, I think I just, there was a there was an album called Black Rock. It was um, the Black Keys and. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Please don't tell me Chris Rock because I'm gonna. Be- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's no, no, no. They had like it was like it was like it was Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys collaborating with like Most Def and um, Jim Jones and different hip hop artists. Nice. They put out an album. It was pretty good. Uh, but anyway, hell yeah, it does sound very Bond villain corporation. It does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Black Rock. So yeah, I, I think to the extent that any of this could possibly be true. Um, Again, it's somewhat irrelevant to the fact there was a reality in the inner cities and that hip hop culture, if the mu- if the musicians own it, I think it's probably a force for change when it's taken out of the hands of greedy corporations. Sure. So let's do that. Okay. It's my final thought. Okay. Too uh, serious, I know, for a no, comedy I mean, podcast. I, but yeah, but it's, it's you kind know. of a, yeah. It's, it, Sorry. It is. What, you know, <laughs> it calls fine. for it. I yeah, do. it is what it is. I don't uh, want to do my hot white guy take on <laughs> I know, right? Rap culture. <laughs> yeah, we just did that for Pull your hour. pants up <laughs> and start singing about change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sad situation. I do think that there is a greater chance for change now. There are more voices out there and we have greater access to more voices that can uh, affect change without quote unquote the man or quote unquote big companies dictating music, I think. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it'll consistently go that way. I will say prisons aren't all bad because uh, <laughs> I've seen uh, a lot of great things pop up on Craigslist recently. Uh, prison, all of their electronics are clear. They look like the old Apple products. Uh, you can get a clear oh, TV. You can oh, get a clear uh, whatever it is because you can't hide contraband and clear hide stuff. stuff. <laughs> but you can get some really cool looking electronics for your crib. Uh, and, <laughs> a lot uh, of those work. I mean, there, it's a TV. I mean, it gets oh, channels. Yeah, but it's a TV that was in a prison. Yeah, but I mean, prisons are just different shaped houses. Every time I see a prison <laughs> in, a, in a TV, it's been like people are fighting over what channel and it's getting hit a lot. Oh yeah. It's a, yeah. Anyway, I love a clear, clear TV. Um, so yeah, that's good about prisons. Um, and that's my final thought. Well, thanks Shane. Yeah. Especially for the levity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What do yeah. you got? Uh, oh man. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, the, the whole privatized prison thing has always bothered me. 
uh, the fact that, it, especially today, because you know most of those guys are um, sitting in jail for probably in states where weed is legal now. Oh yeah, it's so fun. Um, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it's just absolutely ridiculous. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know about the letter. I, I like I said, it still rings true because you see, if you pay attention. You see what they push to people, what they promote. Uh, I think the silver lining, like I said, is that if for any artist nowadays, there are so many channels and ways to push your own art. So we don't need these big corporations. We don't need these labels. That's we can do this shit ourselves. And sure. we can be the change that we want to see in the world. There Absolutely. we go. That's the, the new title of our new album. <laughs> Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, well, uh, this be been fun. Before we do get out of here, uh, first of all, thank you to Hot Fly. Yeah, thank Brewing. you, Hot Fly. Yeah. I drank a smoky Delicious. Pilsner. I had the Total El Tiempo again. Delicious. It is. That is really good. Yeah. What did you, what, what, uh, I had the, uh, Take Note IPA. It's nice. delicious. Nice. I'm also wearing, uh, a, a great beer always trucker's cap from Hot Fly Brewing. Thank nice. Thank you guys for sponsoring us. Yeah. We'll try to add you to the beginning of the pod. Oh, it wasn't. I don't think we mentioned it. Well, I was well. too excited. <laughs> okay, it happens. Um, <laughs> but 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 now before we get out here, where do you have anything coming out in, anytime soon or shows that people can uh, can catch you at? Um, th- there's a show this Friday, but by the time this comes out, uh, it will have already happened. Oh, we'll promote it on our, our uh, IG. Uh, I have another show, but I'm not supposed to announce it yet. And then uh, my album signed an NDA. My, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had a meeting with 30 record execs, <laughs> and they told me not to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, now go to uh, tab1.bandcamp.com, check out my latest album, Glory and the Wait. Uh, I'm also releasing it finally on all uh, digital streaming platforms on nice. my birthday, which is March 23rd, oh, so yeah. check yeah. that out. Happy birthday. And um, Cooley High is, is in the finishing stages of a new album. Hoping to drop that later this year, so stay awesome. tuned. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Well, this has been really fun, man. It's been a very poignant topic, but also you're a great guest to yeah. have for this. I'll, yeah, as I appreciate always. it. Thank appreciate you. all the insights and laughs. Until uh, next time, this has been, uh, what, Conspiracy Beer Me? I'm uh, Justin. I'm Shane, and this was Tab One. Peace. I just realized, if record companies are pushing like, the artists to do what they want to do, there's country artists that probably aren't getting divorced or don't like beer and probably drive a Prius but none of their music's getting played no one's getting-